This program is funded by the members of Prairie Public. We want to welcome you to the Hart Building in Washington, D.C., where it's our pleasure to have a conversation with Senator Ken Conrad. Thank you for inviting us, Senator. Good to be here. And Senator, you've been very active in politics. You've been very active in public service. Why did you get started in public service? Uh, you know, my family was very interested in uh, not necessarily public service, but interested in the news, interested in what was going on in our country, our state, our community. And uh, th that was the talk of the dinner table. And so um, when I was young, we came for a visit in Washington. I sat in the Senate gallery. I watched a debate. Uh, Hubert Humphrey was debating. Robert Kennedy was there. And I thought, you know, I'd like to be a senator someday. And uh, I went home from that visit, and I wrote on the back of an envelope that I'd run for the United States Senate in 1986 or 1988. And I ran in 1986. This is a true story. True story. Amazing. The power of a plan. Amazing. Now, were, were, you, were your family always Democratic? Is, is, was that were the MPL and Democratic politics running? Well, your... part of my family were Democrats. Part of my family were Republicans. My, my grandfather, Roan, Dr. Roan, who is the medical chief of staff at St. Alexis, uh, was a Republican. In fact, he was one of the key funders for Bill Langer, Senator Langer, Governor Langer. Uh, my grandfather was his doctor. My other grandfather, E.J. Conrad, newspaper publisher, um, ran a printing company, uh, started out as a Republican, in fact ran for the legislature in North Dakota as a Republican, and then switched after the Great Depression and became a Democrat. Did those grandfathers ever talk politics with each other? Yeah, <laughs> pretty intense. Uh, both of them were intense, both highly intelligent, uh, both very convinced of their own views, and uh, so their conversations were highly animated. Did, did your uh, grandfather who was with Bill Langer, did he ever talk about Bill Langer? You know, um, he died when I was five years old. So I didn't hear a lot of conversation from that grandfather about Bill Langer. But I did my other grandfather because he was also close to Bill Langer. In fact, they shared a birthday. And every year, Bill Langer would call my grandfather Conrad on their uh, common birthday. In fact, I remember still, just before he died, he called my grandfather. I'm the one that answered the phone. And uh, so in his last months, uh, I remember talking to Bill Langer on the phone. Another senator. Yeah. When you uh, first got started, you actually started uh, in the tax department, didn't you? I did. I was hired by Byron Dorgan and uh, became director of planning and personnel and then ran for tax commissioner when Byron was elected to the United States Senate. And I loved that job. Uh, you know, I became head of the uh, tax administrators in the country. And uh, I really enjoyed that position. It was a tremendous challenge. And, you know, I could wake up every day and have a plan and actually implement it. And I think we did some very good things. I'm very proud of my time as tax commissioner. And I loved that position. Why don't you talk a little bit about uh, a couple of the measures you did with uh, the resources and taxes that North Dakota is benefiting uh, still today from? Well, you know, I was deeply involved in measure number six that set our oil taxes uh, where they are. And that's made a profound difference to the fiscal position of the state of North Dakota. I also started a program called the Fair Share Program. Uh, to audit out-of-state companies that were doing business in North Dakota but were avoiding paying their taxes to our state. And that was a hugely successful program. The legislature gave me an additional million dollars and I promised them we'd get ten dollars back for every dollar that they spent. And uh, we really did better than that. Uh, so that was another initiative I was very proud of. Now you also met someone when you were working as, as tax commissioner. This is a very important person, didn't you? Um, I met the woman who became my wife, Lucy Kaluti. And, uh, you know, Lucy and I were hired really weeks apart. And when we were hired, hired uh, by Byron, didn't particularly like each other. And, uh, and, and really it took years for me first to establish, uh, well, first it started with, I was very res respectful of her work because I, I noticed very quickly she was very, very 
smart and very, very capable. And then over time, uh, developed a friendship. And you know, at some point I realized, really, this woman is my best friend. And then uh, much later, a romantic relationship developed. And uh, you know, she was my campaign manager when I was elected to the United States Senate. So uh, I've been very fortunate. I've been very fortunate to have Byron as a friend and uh, Lucy, who became my wife. Why don't you, why don't you tell us about that, that first uh, very close election that you won for the Senate? You know, that was a remarkable campaign because I started out more than 30 points behind. Uh, the incumbent had a million dollars in the bank when I started. I had something like $126. And uh, most people said I had absolutely no chance. But I really believed I did. And uh, Lucy believed I could win. At least she believed it enough to be my campaign manager. And we launched a campaign that was, uh, at the end, dubbed the biggest upset in North Dakota political history. And uh, so I'm very proud of that campaign and proud of what's followed. Well, it's, it's somewhat ironic uh, how involved you were in the Heidkamp campaign and how similar in many ways that campaign was. Yeah, very similar. Um, there was a similar failure uh, when I was running to deal with agriculture issues uh, by the Republican Party. And that occurred in Heidi's campaign as well. Uh, a failure to get the farm bill through the House of Representatives. And of course, Heidi and I are very like-minded on many issues. She's uh, somebody I consider fiscally responsible. That's been a position I've long taken, that deficits do matter, the debt has to be a concern, and that at the end of the day, if you serve in these positions, you've got a responsibility to get results for the people of North Dakota. That's why they send you here. It's not political posturing. It's not uh, filling a position. What people expect you to do and what you have an obligation to accomplish is to get results. And that's the thing I think I'm most proud of in my service for North Dakota. I'm someone who has gotten results, whether it's disaster relief or farm legislation or when we were able to balance the budget back in the 90s, I was deeply involved in those efforts. Um, getting results is critically important. Well, you had mentioned uh, something about, well, keeping your word. And you, after your first uh, campaign, you, after your elected Senate, you said if the budget wasn't under control, you would not run for that seat again, and you kept your word. You know, it, um, it was a difficult decision because the polls show uh, showed at the time that I could easily win um, even if I ran again, although I had pledged uh, when I announced for office that if the deficit weren't under control, I wouldn't run again. And so we got to 1992, right before our state party convention, and I uh, remember going to sleep one night, um, and just before I did, I told Lucy, I, I'm going to make a decision in the morning, but I just don't want to be another politician that made a promise and didn't keep it. And when I got up the next morning, I told her, you know, that's it. I'm going to announce today that I'm not running for re-election. And uh, it was the right decision. It was certainly the right decision for me. And curiously, um, it didn't leave, uh, it didn't lead to my leaving office because uh, I made that decision in April. In September, Senator Burdick passed away. And I'll never forget, Governor Sinner called me and said, look, you've got to run again. You've got to run for Senator Burdick's seat to fill out his term because otherwise we're losing all of Congressman Dorgan's seniority in the House. We're losing all of Senator Burdick's seniority. We'd lose all of yours. We'd be the only state in the nation with no seniority, none. And we're going into very tough negotiations on farm legislation, critically important to our economic future. Um, I remember, too, they took a poll, uh, and they found two-thirds of Republicans thought I should run to fill out the two, term, uh, the two years left on Senator Burdick's term. So I did run in a special election after the regular elections where Senator Dorgan was elected to my seat, having been our congressman. And uh, then I was elected to fill out the two years of Senator Burdick's term. So 
Uh, I'm the only senator in history who served in both Senate seats from the same state in the same day. So I'm the answer to a trivia question if anyone ever asks. How important is seniority uh, when you're talking about Washington, D.C.? Well, it's very important. Um, I mean, that's just the fact. Uh, you do not become a committee chairman unless you're senior. Um, when decisions are made, those who are most senior are the ones in the room. Uh, at the end of uh, 2008, because I was chairman of the Budget Committee, I was in the room when the Secretary of the Tre Treasury and the Chairman of the Federal Reserve came and told the leaders of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, there were about 15 or 18 of us in the room, that they were taking over the large insurance company AIG the next morning. And they told us if they did not, there would be a financial collapse in this country within days. Now, I was in that room in part because I had seniority. Um, I was in that room in part because I was budget committee chairman, but of course you don't become a chairman unless you have seniority. And right or wrong, that is the way the system works. If you're a junior member, you're not in that room. And by and large, you're not in the room when the most significant decisions are made. Now, in North Dakota politics, um, the Democrats were sort of on a downswing and uh, you took it on yourself to see if you could raise the stock of the Democratic Party in uh, North Dakota in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, how did that work out? Well, we did very, very well for a long time. Uh, of course, Senator Dorgan was central to that effort, as was Congressman Pomeroy, Governor Sinner. Uh, Governor Link and Governor Guy had built a base of respect for the Democratic Party. Um, but I worked to reinvigorate our efforts and we captured control of the state senate for the first time um, in history and we were uh, really a very competitive party uh, for a long period there in the 80, 80s and 90s. Um, in recent years have not been as competitive for a lot of reasons um, but I did take pride in that team effort as did Senator Dorgan and Congressman Pomeroy. Well, for so many years, even though um, the Republicans are pretty much controlling the House and the Senate in North Dakota, um, yourself, Senator Dorgan, and uh, Congressman Pomeroy, not only being elected, but elected by quite generous margins as well. And for a period uh, there, uh, Byron and I were rated among our constituencies uh, the most popular senators in the country. That is when they compared our popularity in our constituencies with other senators, uh, we were first, second, third for quite a number of years. And I always took pride in that too, that we were uh, representing a Republican state, but we were, had very high levels of approval. And, uh, and again, I, that goes back to getting results. Because there's a lot of talk in politics. Some of it very inspiring talk, some of it just talk. And uh, I think North Dakotans especially appreciate people who produce results. And that's been something I've been very riveted on in my time here. Well, you talked about it inspiring. Uh, very early on, you were one of the people that uh, uh, endorsed President Obama, who went out. What, what was involved in that decision? <laughs> uh, you know, he and I were friendly in the United States Senate. He wrote in one of his books that he liked my sense of humor. He called me uh, one day. I was in the Senate gym, actually. And he said, look, you're going to keep sitting on the sidelines. You're going to come out and help your pal. And I said, you know, if we can reach a number of uh, understandings on things that are critically important to my state, I'll come out and help you. And so he uh, had his chief of staff at the time call me and we talked about a number of issues that were critical to me. Farm legislation, water projects that are important to North Dakota's economic future, um, location of military assets, the future of our military bases. Uh, those were things that were very important to me and obviously um, being fiscally responsible. Um, I knew from my time in the Senate that he had a similar view on those issues. Uh, so uh, 
I wanted to make certain that we had an understanding that I wouldn't be surprised. And uh, I agreed to go and help. Well, your wife Lucy told us that you really think everything out, that uh, before you speak, before you make an action, you'll, you'll really give it a lot of thought. And, and she mentioned one of those issues was the war in Iraq um, and your feelings about the war in Iraq. Well, that was an especially challenging time because if you remember at the time, the media was really beating the drums for war. And there was enormous confusion in the country after 9-11 as to who was responsible. And some, uh, I think, added to the confusion by suggesting Iraq had something to do with the attack in the United States on 9-11. And of course, we know Iraq was not involved. It was Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda that's involved in many different countries, headquartered at the time in Afghanistan. Uh, it really had nothing to do with Iraq. And somehow, I thought it was one of the most unusual decisions in the entire time I've been here. We're attacked by Al-Qaeda largely headquartered in Afghanistan, and we decide to go and attack Iraq. And uh, I think it was a huge mistake, and uh, I knew it was very unpopular to take that position, but I thought it was the right position, and uh, my conscience would really not permit me to say otherwise. I knew it could be the end of my political service, uh, but, I, but I knew I could not endorse a policy that made no sense to me. I was absolutely in favor of going after Al-Qaeda. I strongly supported going into Afghanistan. I very strongly supported going after the Al-Qaeda leadership. Uh, and I'm very proud that we got the Al-Qaeda leadership. Uh, you know, of the top 50 leaders, the majority of them have been taken down by us. In fact, the significant majority, including uh, the very head. So uh, I was willing to take aggressive action, but I wasn't willing to go to war with a country that hadn't been part of the attack on the United States. Did you uh, take heat at home for that? Did you hear from constituents the, that that was the wrong way to go? You know, really not many. Um, it was much more the national media who just were uh, really beating the drums for war. And uh, so, you know, there was speculation in the national media uh, that I was doing something that would, you know, possibly be the end of my career, but uh, I didn't worry too much about that. And, and really the response back home, I think in part because people know me, um, and when I had a chance to explain why I did what I did, uh, I was largely supported. Do you find it's tougher nowadays to get that opportunity to explain why you make decisions, this uh, you know, time of soundbite after soundbite? You know, uh, it's one of the frustrations here is that um, so much of news media coverage is the 30-second soundbite. And... Um, but, you know, the great thing about North Dakota is people do listen and people are serious minded. And they're also fair minded. They give you a chance to explain your side of the story. And I think that's very, I mean, it's one of the endearing things about our state and our people. Going back a little bit in your life, how, how do you feel that the tragic death of your parents when you were five years old. How did that, that shape your life, do you think, and maybe get you into public service? You know, I don't know. Uh, I think um, probably it made me uh, more self-reliant because I was really pretty much on my own from the time I was 16. You know, I went overseas to school with friends of our family uh, graduated from high school from uh, American military base overseas, Tripoli, Libya, Wheelis Air something Force Base. Most people don't know. And uh, so I was really on my own from a young age, and so I was very independent, and I was I was very responsible. 
because I knew there wasn't anybody to uh, bail me out. I mean, if I made a mistake, if I didn't apply myself, there was only one person who was going to suffer. It was going to be me. So I think, you know, I was very responsible, very grown up at an early age, probably unusually. My, my brother, my oldest brother, who just passed away, used to joke that, you know, you were really raised uh, with 18th century values because <laughs> I was raised by my grandparents. And in many ways, that's true. I mean, I'm sort of uh, not a, a child of my age because I wasn't raised by y younger parents. I was raised by my grandparents. And so uh, values that were really important, you know, at the, in the late 1800s and the early 1900s that are very basic things. Honesty, hard work, independence. You get what you yourself work for. That's pretty deep in my value system. Now, you have a, a new wife. You come to Washington, D.C. for the first time. Uh, how tough a transition was that? It was very tough. It took me a long time. I was, um, you know, I was sort of in culture shock almost in Washington, D.C. And, and in Congress because this place doesn't operate the way I thought it would. You know, I, I had this view, you know, you come here, you work hard, you make your case, um, and the right side will prevail. Well, that's not always the case around here. And uh, there's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of what I call hoorah. There's a lot of um, <laughs> uh, political spin that goes on. And, and also Washington, D.C. at that time uh, was really not doing well. And so our, neighbor, our neighborhood, the middle class neighborhood just 10 blocks from here, uh, there was a lot of crime. There were a lot of, you know, we'd have people trying to break into our house at 2 o'clock in the morning. We had people succeeding at breaking into our house uh, numerous times. Of course, the attack on my wife, uh, which was really a stunning thing by a, a, a rapist. Uh, and thank God she got away from him. She tricked him and got away from him. So these were, there was a fair amount of trauma in those early years. So you stuck it out? Yeah, we stuck it out, and we've done well. And my wife is tough in the very best way. And, uh, but it was, it was very tough. You know, you got a guy, a rapist, they, they think was guilty of 45 violent crimes in our neighborhood. And uh, assault my wife in the middle of the night. And, uh, you know, I confronted them. And he told me if I took one more step, he was going to blow her head off. He had a 45 automatic at her head. Uh, that, that's something you don't forget. That, that really, really, it's interesting because that could really shape your, your, your whole life in legislation, your, whether you run for office or not again, uh, yeah. where, you know, whether you stay in the neighborhood. Yeah, we didn't have any choice but to stay in the neighborhood because we had realtors that came to our house. They said, look, this has got so much attention, you couldn't sell this out. You couldn't give this house away. Um, so we were stuck. And, uh, you know, my wife is a brave person and she is a courageous person um, but that was a tough tough deal well when we talk about lucy for a second yeah. here you are you married your campaign manager which uh might be tougher than marriage i don't know running a <laughs> campaign um, and then for many years she worked as uh, chief of staff for byron dorgan one of your best friends we had an unusual situation i i don't know of any other senator who has um, his wife serving as chief of staff to the senator from his state. But I think it's testimony to our really close friendship. You know, Byron and I are like brothers. And um, uh, Lucy was really part of the team. And we did this as a real team effort. You know, very often senators from the same state, even if they're of the same party, are very competitive with each other and don't work well together. 
our situation was just the reverse of that. Yes, there was competition, a healthy competition, but we really wished the best for each other. And uh, we, we are like brothers. So yeah, we, we can be competitive and are and were, uh, but we also, at the end of the day, are family. And so we stuck together, worked together. Of course, Congressman Pomeroy was part of that as well. And uh, I think that paid huge dividends for North Dakota. I don't think there was another delegation that was anywhere close to being as close as we have been. You know, we actually socialize together. We spend Thanksgiving together. We, we do things together. Now, that's just unheard of around here. Well, even with Team North Dakota active, uh, there must have been a couple times that you bumped head on some issues. Can you think of any issues that, that, that you guys didn't agree on? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, probably the place where Byron and I had the most disagreement were on certain trade issues. Um, not a dramatic difference, but, um, you know, I would be against some trade agreements for others. Byron tended to oppose most of them. So that would be an, an area where we had disagreement. But on so many others, uh, it was like we could complete each other's sentences. We, we just think so much alike. We almost didn't have to talk um, about something because we just think the same way. In many ways, have the same value system. I think very much rooted in um, the agricultural background of North Dakota. And I've said many times, you can't fake farming. You know, the crop is planted or it's not. It's been uh, cultivated or it hasn't. It's been harvested or it hasn't. You can't just talk about it. And I think that is very deep in the culture of North Dakota. And I think it's very deep in uh, Byron and me. Well, talking about your career in the Senate, we couldn't uh, let it go by without mentioning the fact that you enjoy charts. <laughs> you know, uh, one year, I'll never forget, the, the Rules Committee called me up and said, you know, Senator, we are making more charts for you than all the other senators combined. And the chart making operation simply can't keep up with your demand. And we have just had a vote in the committee and decided to provide you with your own chart making machine so that we can take this load off of the agency that's responsible for these things and give it to you. So you got your own machine. Uh, that's it. We, we, we're not going to do any more for you. I outlined here today. Mr. President, I found that it's very helpful for my colleagues to understand these complex budget matters if they can not only hear it, but they can see it. And that's why I found these charts, these visuals, so important to helping colleagues understand um, our budget circumstance. Did you create a trend? Did you notice other people using it? Oh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's mushroomed. And I've had a lot of fun with it, too. You know, one time Jay Rockefeller, uh, I'd given a, a speech on the floor, and he told me how much he admired my charts. So I got some of the worst charts I've ever prepared and I sent him over to his office wrapped in a bow. And I said, now what I'd like to do is trade you for some of the artwork in your office. You know, he has some of the classics, Monet, Manet, Degas, Picasso, and I offered to trade him even up my charts for his artwork. And Jay really enjoyed the humor in that. <laughs> <laughs> I see you don't have one hanging on your wall here. No, but I got a lot of Walter Peel. A lot of Walter Peel, that's yeah, great. Yeah, Walter Peel is my favorite. And uh, Walter Peel, of course, North Dakota artist from Minot, North Dakota. And you can see uh, on every wall, there's Walter Peel. Do you, uh, when you go back to North Dakota, where do you go and what do you enjoy and who do you enjoy visiting? Well, when I go home, and I go home a lot, um, I am constantly going around the state because I've tried to go to every county every year that I've been here. Now, I've not accomplished that every year. I remember one year we had one county left and we were flying out to go to that county and ran into an incredible blizzard and the pilot looked over his shoulder and said, we got to go back. But um, 
by and large, I've gone to every county every year uh, or very close to it. And that means I'm constantly on the move. I'm constantly, um, you know, you finish a, a work week here that's often intense, fly home, go town to town to town, come back here, another intense week, then fly back there. It's really part of the reason I decided not to run again. Um, living out of a suitcase 30 or 40 percent of the time um, it just becomes less attractive. You know, I've missed 80 percent of my wife's birthdays, 80 percent of our anniversaries, um, and was, you know, um, it was important to do in order to represent the people of our state. But, you know, over time, as you get older, you begin to think, at least I have, gee, am I going to continue to live this kind of vagabond existence, or am I going to have a real life? Is that, do you think that's the main reason you decided not to run, or are there other factors as well? Well, there were certainly other factors. I mean, uh, you know, I, I am known as a centrist here. Uh, somebody once told me the only thing in the middle of the road is roadkill. <laughs> and look, this is a very tough town. And uh, if, you're, if you're a centrist, you draw fire from both sides. Uh, the party opposite doesn't like you, and some of your own party is not very happy with you because you aren't just down the line. And, uh, you know, that's... <laughs> That's a, that's a tough way to live when you're, you know, drawing fire from both sides almost all the time. And I'll tell you, if you're budget committee chairman on top of that, which means part of your job is to say no. I don't think most people understand a budget committee chairman here is responsible for scoring all legislation, to say what things cost. The budget committee chairman determines that. And people think CBO decides, the Congressional Budget Office or Joint Committee on Tax does, the Budget Committee Chairman does. And so you're just constantly uh, being asked to kind of bend the rule here, or, you know. And, you know, I tried very hard to play it straight. And, you know, you, when you do that, that means you're going to disappoint even some of your real close friends. Um, you know, they have a piece of legislation and they want it scored in a favorable way and you say, you know, that isn't, that isn't the way the rules are. You know, frankly, in those circumstances, uh, they're not all that interested in the rules being followed. They want, you know, they want some kind of special consideration and they always have a rationale for it. Um, but look, for the most part, uh, it's been an incredible honor I've enjoyed the challenge, but it's also good to have somebody else have a shot at this. What are you going to miss the most, do you think? Getting results, getting something done that I think is important. You know, I've loved being in those negotiations on the last two farm bills and getting what I think are the best legislation that North Dakota has ever had. And I think it's one reason our economy is doing well. Um, and I think it's one reason natu uh, natural, national agricultural economy is doing well. Those are really good uh, pieces of legislation. They've mattered to real people. Uh, getting, you know, some of the funding for disaster relief in North Dakota, especially after the disasters in 97, Grand Forks and Fargo, uh, Wahpeton, we got one of the best disaster relief packages ever in the history of the country. I'm very proud of that. Defending our Air Force bases, Minot and Grand Forks. When I went to the Senate, there were 16 Northern Tier Air Force bases. Today there are three, and two of the three are in North Dakota. That didn't just happen. That happened because of a strategy and a plan and determined effort over an extended period of time. Uh, so those are things that meant a lot to me and mean a lot to me. And being part of the effort to actually balance our budget back in the 90s. And I was deeply involved. I was the co-leader of the Deficit Reduction Caucus in the Senate. We produced plan after plan, and the last plan we produced is very close to what was adopted that actually balanced the budget and did so for three years. Now, with your crystal ball, what's going to happen in the budget in the future? 
I spend all morning in a meeting on that very subject, negotiating with senators, four Democrats, four Republicans. Look, I'm very hopeful that we're going to get back on track. So something before you leave. Uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful. It's critically important for the country that we get an agreement, that we move this country to higher ground. And it can be done. And it isn't that hard. And I'm, it's hard to actually get agreement. It is not that hard to put in place a plan that would actually do the job. Good luck right, yeah. for all of us. Uh, energy in North Dakota, booming, booming, booming. Uh, what are your views on, on energy and what's happening out in Western North Dakota? Well, first of all, uh, it's hugely important, not only for North Dakota, but for the country. Just a study out today that says the United States will be energy independent by 2030. That's 18 years from now. Energy independent. You I mean, you think of what that means for our nation. It's incredible. Um, instead of sending a billion dollars a day to buy foreign energy, that money stays here at home. Uh, that means jobs, economic development, that means uh, increased national security. Uh, so look, this is hugely important. And of course, it's not just what's happening in North Dakota. It's uh, largely natural gas that's being found around the rest of the country as well. And of course, oil. Um, and of course, renewables, because we have made dramatic improvement there. And we have a chance with greater efficiency, energy efficiency, to make even greater headway. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. Um, I also recognize, look, uh, this development also creates challenges, whether it's roads, bridges, housing, law enforcement, um, that any time you're in the midst of a boom, that creates all kinds of struggles and strains. I just had a, a couple move from Williston, North Dakota, uh, rent an apartment from me in Bismarck. Uh, because they could no longer afford rent in Williston, North Dakota, after living there their whole lives. That, that is a challenge for the state. It's uh, the plus and minuses of uh, the, the oil development out there. But what, what, what about fracking? Fracking is something that, that you hear endlessly uh, being debated. Uh, what are your views on fracking? I think fracking is being handled in a very responsible way in North Dakota. I've been on the well sites. I've seen what's being done. You know, our situation is simply different structurally in a geological way from other parts of the country. As you go further east, there, is, uh, there can be a problem with fracking because the water table is so close to the oil. That's not the case in North Dakota. As you know, in North Dakota, we're down 10,000 feet. That's where we're drilling for the oil. The water table is much higher. So the vulnerability you have is not, uh, uh, a problem of oil getting interchanged with the water supply. The only vulnerability you have is when you pierce uh, the water supply. And if you look at how it's done, steel concrete, steel concrete, um, the risk is really very low. If you move east, parts of New York, parts of Pennsylvania, where the water table is very close to the oil, that's a different situation. We're going to switch gears here a little bit, and I know you enjoy baseball, to say the least. Why don't you tell us about your love affair with baseball? You know, when I was growing up, I wanted to be the next Mickey Mantle. Um, and the first time I faced a pitcher that threw a tough curveball, I realized I was not going to be the next Mickey Mantle, instantly. Um, but I never lost my love for baseball. And in addition to the love for baseball, you love numbers. So how do you combine the two of them? <laughs> well, there's nothing better than being a baseball fan if you like numbers, because baseball is all about numbers. And, uh, you know, I don't have the same reservoir of knowledge that I once had. But, you know, when I was younger, I was like encyclopedic in my knowledge of you know, how many home runs the players hit and what their batting averages had been. And, you know, I, I love numbers. And there aren't many people who do, <laughs> but I do. And uh, so I, I think that's part of my attraction to baseball. Now, do A people, lot of numbers. Do people sitting next to you move away when you start uh, 
doing batting averages oh, for them? Oh, my, my, my wife has outed me. Well, one thing I like to do at baseball games is I like to calculate um, when somebody's up and they get a hit, how that changes their batting average. So I like to do these, you know, mental calculations and then report to my wife what somebody's batting average has become. And I don't know, it appeals to me. <laughs> <laughs> and you were talking earlier before we were on camera about uh, spring training and how you get to spring training and have over the years. Uh, honestly, there is really almost nothing I like better than going to spring training. Um, I just I love being in those intimate ballparks, spring, the grass, the, you know, you always are optimistic about the coming season. And of course, I'm a Baltimore Orioles fan and we've had a lot of losing seasons here until this one. Um, but hope springs eternal, you know, and you can always think, boy, that pitching staff's looking pretty good. It looks like we're hitting, you know, fielding is going to be improved. And, um, you know, so that's part of the romance of baseball. And we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the little fellow on your lap there. Yep, this is our little guy, Dakota. And, uh, you know, we brought him into our house household about three and a half years ago. And he'd been abandoned. And uh, so he's got real separation issues. So he comes to work with me every day. And he's become a celebrity around here. You know, Brian Williams did this show, A Day in the Life of the Senate. And at the end, he dubbed Dakota the 101st senator. He said he's in more important meetings than most senators. <laughs> and, you know, um, they showed him as we'd go around the Senate during the day, you know, Senator McCain greeting him, Majority Leader Reid being down on the floor with him saying, anything you need, Dakota? And other senators, um, I mean, he is, he is really very popular here. As you get to the end of your political career, you really helped someone with their political career just a couple months ago. Um, maybe you could talk about your relationship with uh, Heidi Heitkamp and uh, how you feel about the election. Well, I hired Heidi 30 years ago to be my lawyer in the tax department. And uh, then she became my general counsel and then succeeded me when I came to the Senate, ran for attorney general, was successful in that position, ran for governor. Uh, she and her husband have been very close friends for ever since. Um, I hired her those 30 years ago. So I was delighted. It was one of the best evenings of my life uh, to see her succeed me. It left me with a, a deep, deep sense of satisfaction because I know the people of North Dakota will be well represented by her. She has the character and the quality and North Dakota values are deep in her and she is results oriented. And she's also willing to reach across the aisle to work with the other side to get things done, which is so important here. Um, so I, I'm just delighted. She's such a North Dakota girl. Uh, what do you think the adjustment to D.C. will be for? It'll be hard. Uh, it'll be hard because, uh, you know, this is a very urban setting. And there's a lot of play acting, I call it, that goes on here. Uh, political posturing. And that, that gets tedious because it, it doesn't really produce anything. You know, it doesn't advance um, solving problems. But, but, but this town, and a part of it's the, the media, because they cover all this stuff and they love to hype stuff. And so my colleagues figure that out. And so what do they do? I mean, they give these speeches that have almost no relationship to any reality, but it's all hype. Um, and uh, the news media, especially the, the uh, stations that are on 24 hours a day, have got a lot of hours to fill. What's, what is it they cover? The most outlandish thing that's happened that day. And so what that does is encourage outlandish behavior. Boy, that's not Heidi Heitkamp, you know. That's, that's, and and I, I don't think that's um, really the values of a state like ours. I mean, people are 
you know, okay, we got a problem. How do we solve it? Here are the options. Let's pick one. Let's do it. Let's see if it works. If it doesn't, we'll do something else. And uh, that's the way Heidi is, and that's the way this place needs to be more like. What's in the future for Ken Conrad? You know, I really, I have no idea. I, I have no idea what I'm going to do next. And I, people seem shocked by that. How could you leave this position and this position of respect, being a United States senator, a senior United States senator, how could you leave that when you have no idea what you're going to be doing? Uh, I, I, I really don't know what I'm going to do. But something good will happen, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Well, we want to thank you, Senator, for carving out this time to yeah. let us have a conversation with you. And we want to thank all of you for joining us on this special conversation with our retiring Senator, Senator Ken Conrad. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This program is funded by the members of Prairie Public.